Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, your host, and I'm joined with uh, Representative Andrew Manus uh, from Derry, New Hampshire. Uh, I want to welcome you to the show, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Uh, big handshake because uh, I, uh, I view you as one of the heroes. And uh, I recently had uh, Representative Seth Cohn on not too long ago. And one of the reasons I wanted you to come on the show is because I have ultimate respect for you and the way you've been voting. Uh, the last couple of years. And uh, there are a lot of issues. There were about 14, 15, maybe 1,600 bills that came before the House. I'm, I don't know the exact number. And I don't know the exact content of every one of those bills. But uh, we, we had some pretty controversial bills that came up. Uh, and uh, one of them uh, you worked very, worked very hard on. And that had to be with the, uh, the, the compacts versus the exchanges. Uh, the Obamacare, you, you were very influential as far as uh, setting the tone. Can you talk a little bit about your involvement with, the, with that piece of legislation? Sure, I'd be glad to, Kevin, but first I really want to say that you, you are one of the heroes of the House because of your work on the Redress of Grievances Committee. It's a really important committee. I'm now sitting on the uh, study committee to look at the GAL board and what kind of reforms need to be done to uh, fix the board that oversees the guardian ad litems, which is, are critical to parental rights and keeping children with their parents, which is where they belong. Right. Um, and I don't know anyone who worked harder on that issue than you, so I certainly wouldn't want to start off this program talking about me. <laughs> well, you know, it was a Henry Ford that said, smart, surround yourself with smart people, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I view you as one of those guys. And uh, I. I know that there are a lot of issues. The guardian ad litems was one of them. We brought it up many times at the, uh, at the redress of grievance. It seems uh, many people are being harmed by the, uh, the insulated organization, which is unaccountable to anybody, it seems. Well, the, uh, the problem it really, uh, from what I've seen, because we just met today, it, it seems like no one knows who's supposed to oversee the guardian ad litems. It's just they're, they're out there doing their thing, and if someone screws up, then there's no one to hold them accountable. And, and, and to me, that's the most egregious part. I mean, what you really need to do is give the GAL board more authority uh, and to license these people. And I'm against licensing most of the time, but this is one of those fields. They're government employees. They should be up to speed. They should know what they're doing. They should know that they actually have to interview both parents in a divorce case right. and not just one of them. Right. Uh, and it's to get both sides and then make an objective uh, decision based on what they see in, in both homes rather than just go to one of the homes and say, oh, this, this is great. We'll just give the kids this person and not even go and look at the other house. Well, which is what's happening. It, it, it's very, very involved where you can have where personality conflicts and uh, somebody could lose their child just because of a personality conflict with the guardian right. ad litem. Uh, documents put in sealed envelopes which accuses a parent of something and they have no idea or no way to address that. The Supreme Court gave the guardian ad litems quasi immunity. So basically they have more immunity than police officers in dealing with, with certain cases. So these are just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Let me just give some advice to your, your listeners, your viewers. Um, if you're married, stay married. Don't ever get divorced. Work it out with your husband or wife. It's worth it, believe me. And if you are in this situation, God, God be with you, because New Hampshire has a reputation for being the baby snatcher state for a good reason. And, you know, I, my neighbors tell me about this, and when their kids were taken from them, um, in, in divorce cases, of course, right. and uh, 
you know, and, and then uh, I, I heard from another gentleman today who's actually running for state rep up in Manchester, uh, Carlo, I forgot his last name, yeah. but uh, he um, had his kids taken from him, his biological kids taken from him and given to someone who wasn't their biological uh, yeah. parent. Just Carl, Carlo will be coming on the show uh, oh. eventually. Uh, Great. He has a unique story in, in itself. It is a unique story. Uh, okay. But the, the fact is his biological children were taken away from him and... Uh, what, whether the courts treat him fair or not, uh, based upon either hearsay or uh, if there's money tied to it. Uh, it corruption. Co it's corruption. And Title IV money, the whole nine yards. So. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that... I'm really we, glad you're bringing that to light. But uh, let, me, let me answer your question about um, o Obamacare, because right. that's how you, you started. Um, essentially, I introduced HB 1297 which prohibited the state from creating a state insurance exchange uh, under the Obamacare Act. And what that is basically is it's a, a place where the government is, is, you know, sets up this false marketplace where you play by their rules to the letter and you get to play in, in that government-sponsored marketplace. And, um, you know, essentially what it's going to do is raise the premiums substantially because um, you have to, all these new mandates and all these new requirements that you're going to have to comply with in order to sell insurance in this exchange. Now, um, the law allowed states to set up an exchange or default to a federal one. However, there were a lot of incentives provided in, in the act so that states would set one up because the federal government doesn't know how to do that. They've never done anything like it before. It's not their role. And it's, well, it's not their role either. So they had, you know, they were, they put a lot of incentives in there, subsidies to bring that cost of health insurance down. However, you know, where's that, that cost going to go? Well, it's going to go to taxes and it's going to go to, um, you know, uh, printing money and, and, and reducing the value of the dollar. So eventually, we're going to pay for it, even if, it, if the subsidies do reduce the cost in the short term. Long term, they're going to go up. So, you know, the, the basic um, crux of this is the federal government needed us to set up these state exchanges in order to implement Obamacare. We prohibited them from doing that in New Hampshire. And that's what your bill was, that's was doing? That's what my bill did, yes. So essentially what we've said to them is, okay, we are not bluffing your turn, what are you going to do? And they can't do it. So now that they've come up with this idea of creating a partnership exchange, um, and of course a partnership exchange is the same thing. They get to, the states to do all their work for them, and uh, they get to tell the states what to do. Still sticking the nose under the tent like the, the camera. They're just out. trying every angle they can Change to get wording, this in. Change same problem. And, and I believe the 1297 prohibits that too. But thankfully, even with the most liberal uh, interpretations of the act, they still have to go to an oversight committee uh, of senators and representatives, three representatives and three senators, to get permission to set up this partnership exchange. So that's happening in September, actually, and I'm, I'm on that committee. Right. Um, HB 1297 amended the law having to do with that committee and it, it basically prohibited us from implementing a state-based exchange, which I believe prohibits partnership exchange as well. Um, but the, the liberal interpretation is that the oversight committee gets to decide on a partnership exchange. Now, on the oversight committee, does that have to get voted on before for the full House and the Senate, or do they, nope. they make the final decision? There will be three House members and three senators, uh, me being one of the three House members, um, uh, Representative John Hunt and uh, Representative Dick Berry are the other two, and then Senator Hood, uh, Senator um, Booten, and Senator White are the three senators on this committee, and, and those six people uh, are going to decide whether the state of New Hampshire is going to have a partnership exchange or not, which is really upsetting to me um, to have that kind of power. That's a lot of power. Yeah. Now, what happens if uh, the three senators disagree with the, uh, the three reps? Well, as you know, a motion, um, a positive motion to adopt a partnership exchange uh, would be defeated by a vote of three to three. So uh, right now it's looking like New Hampshire is going to be just, just fine because we have three votes uh, against a partnership exchange, at least, and possibly now, more. Now the alternative to the exchange, uh, this, the terminology co-op. 
Uh, well, you're talking about something different okay. uh, that I was not involved with. There's a, there's something called a compact, actually. Okay, compact. I and, and what the compact idea was is that we asked the federal government for under the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. What to, is that? <laughs> uh, what's that? Well, <laughs> God help us. Under the, under the U.S. Constitution, there's a provision that allows states to form contracts with each other called compacts. However, those compacts must be approved by Congress. So what we asked um, Congress to do, actually, is to, form, to be able to form an agreement with a group of other states to manage Medicaid on our own and Medicare on our own. Um, what is the likelihood of that happening? Well, it it's didn't pass. I mean, and even if it did pass, you would still have Congress to, have, you know, to deal with it. Now, the, the basis of that law was Rhode Island actually successfully received a block grant, I believe for Medicare, I'm not, my memory might be deserving me, but it was either Medicare or Medicaid, and there, Medicare is the program for the elderly, Medicaid is for the uh, less fortunate, so, and Obamacare expands Medicaid drastically. Um, I'll get to that later, but anyway, the uh, federal government gave Rhode Island a block grant to manage one of these programs on their own, so far, they've been able to cut costs drastically using the money that they're getting in a block from the federal government. and Without the strings attached. And without the strings attached. And they're still serving the same group, if not you know, more people. But it's, a, it's been a dramatic success. So the idea behind a compact is we can still you know, provide these services at the state level, which is where they're supposed to be uh, constitutionally, uh, provided the Tenth Amendment says any powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states or the people. So very clearly, um, this is something the state should be doing. I don't see anywhere in the U.S. Constitution that says the federal government can manage a, a health care program. It's, it's, they just don't have that power. So they've been acting extra constitutionally for about 100 years now, and it's it's about time that we think about getting things back to the way they're supposed to be. And we could do that without leaving anyone out to dry and make sure that people are, are taken care of in the transition back to limited government, which is very important to, you know, particularly the elderly and the less fortunate. Now, you said this, this failed. We, didn't, we weren't able to take advantage we, we of didn't, this option? We didn't pass the compact law. And what did we try to? Yeah, it passed the House. It didn't pass the Senate. But I wasn't really involved with that. I had, um, I had advocated for the bill. Um, I went and spoke on it, but it wasn't one of my bills that I sponsored. I was, I was more involved with the exchange idea, which is something completely and totally different. That's a government-run fake marketplace, essentially. Does fascism come to mind? Yeah, well, that's exactly what it is. Um, I mean, if, if you want to look at the definition of, of fascism, it's when government colludes with business to... Um, for mutual benefit of, of business and government or with, with the people who are being served by that, of course, not really a factor. So the government picking winners and losers in yeah. the marketplace. Right. And that's happening over and over again. Why is this not becoming a dirty word in our country? Because, wasn't, wasn't because Hitler... fascism is, is one of those words that you use it and people think you're a kook right away if you use that word. Um, they... Was Hitler a fascist? Yes. But you, know, you, you, know, fascist? What, you know what na Nazi is, right? It's in German, it's Nazi. Uh, it means National Socialist Party. They're socialists. That's all they are. Fascists is, uh, fascism is a form of socialism. What is the difference, <coughs> uh, Representative, between fascism, socialism, and progressivism? They are identical in form, in my opinion. So the terminologies change, but right. it's the same product. Uh, the, the, what it is is you have government working with business, um, big business, not small business, but big business, to control an economy. Now, we were talking with uh, Representative Cohen here about the occupiers, and that seems to be one of their, uh, their claims is that they're, they're angry with the government uh, and the corporations colluding. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, if you talk to the Tea Parties... It's socialism, it's fascism, it's, it, it's progressive, that's what they believe in. And if you talk with the Tea Parties, they're, they're angry with the same thing. If you talk with the people on, on the Ron Paul uh, side, if you will, they, they, they don't want the federal government doing any of this stuff. Uh, no, or, they shouldn't be. And then if you look at the Constitution, it's not their role. 
No, it's not their role. And, and it, you know, one of the f funny things about um, the Oversight Committee, there was an article in today's paper about Senator Hood. Um, I just learned that he has a conflict of interest. Uh, yeah. You know, he works for um, one of the largest providers of Medicaid, and later this year he's potentially going to vote on whether or not to expand Medicaid. In one of the most powerful positions on the particular topic. Right, and I just learned about this. This is crazy. I, I mean, I, I sit next to this guy almost on the committee. Uh, it, is there any uh, attempt to ask him to step down? Well, the, I mean, the rules, the ethics rules are pretty loose in this state. That's something else that really needs to be fixed up. I mean, the, the, the concept was this is a citizen legislature, so, you know, people have to work and make money, and, you know, that that can't impede them from also serving. And, you know, there's some truth to that. There's sure. some value to that. But at the same time, when something is so directly going to affect your living, um, like if you're an auto mechanic and you go up and speak on the bill to uh, change auto inspections from annual to biannual, if you, if you do that, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to do it under the ethics rules, but should you be? No, absolutely not. It's a total conflict of interest. Well, what if you're an attorney? Oh, I'm not even going to get there. But anyway, let me get back to the, the Medicaid expansion. I mean, we're going to be voting on this later later this year, potentially. We, we need to not do it because it's essentially a fast track to the single-payer system, which is not good. That's the lowest common de denominator. We're basically saying, okay, everyone has to have this product mandated by the federal government. Right. Everyone's in the same pool, and everyone's going to get the same crappy product, which means they're going to die younger. Uh, they're not going to get the same quality health care because everyone's the same. You know, you have to be able to, to purchase Com higher quality products. Competition breeds excellence. Right. And lower prices. Right. And that's, that's the marketplace? That's, that's well, our and, and that's not anything close to what we have right now. Now, you're not running again. No. Uh, we're going to miss you, and I, hopefully I get elected, but uh, def we're definitely going to be missing you. But you're still going to be somewhat involved uh, in, in, to some degree. Or you well, you know, I, I had a little boy. Uh, he was born in April, yeah. and uh, I decided when the filing period came up in uh, June, I think, right? And it's, uh, it just, I can't take that much time away from my family uh, right. for another two years uh, and not make money. Um, you know, I, I had my wife's blessing to serve uh, as my full-time job to serve in the legislature, and I did, as you can attest to. Right. Um, but, you know, I can't do that for another two years. I need to make some money, so I'm stepping down. Business has actually been good the last couple months, uh, and uh, hopefully that keeps up. Um, I had my business while I was a state rep, but obviously it took the back burner. Right. Um, because you're, you, as you know, I'm sure, <laughs> you have a business. It suffered. Yeah. Substantially. Yeah. So, you know, I had to make the decision, you know, I, my business has got to take priority for a little while other than my, you know, clearly my family is my top priority, but, you know, the business has got to come in second place. And I'm trying to figure out a way right now to make the business work so that I can actually go up and advocate uh, on, on legislation. I mean, I, my business is PR, public relations, so, you know, maybe I can... Uh, get a lobbyist job. Maybe I could, um, you know, get get a couple lobbyist clients, in, in other words, and go up and, and work uh, right. on lobbying for liberty, up and up in Concord. Right. I, I know that you're a principled individual, so you're 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 uh, for hire for for particular. Oh, I would never work for just anybody, which right. is probably why it's not going to work out. But. <laughs> The, well, the money is out. Money out there today. I mean, I, I, counter to what people want to tell you in the in the media, uh, the big money out there is funding Barack Obama and his people who want to make big government and big business the pretty much the uh, the feudal lords. We're going back to feudalism. What are your thoughts about the media, real quickly, if you don't mind me? I mean, you Unless had to you do. You know, with I I'm a you know I'm a journalist. I have a master's degree from Boston University. I was uh, where I was employed by the Boston Herald, uh, the Metro West Daily News. I was the editor of the Manchester Express. So I've got a lot long history in journalism. Um, and I've, I've experienced firsthand how left wing they really are inside the gates. I mean, they're, they're crazy left wing. It's, it's nauseating. It, it really is. But I mean, and they, they temper themselves, believe me. If you were inside a newsroom and heard them talking, you would know how communists they really are. 
Um, but, you know, we're uh, not just throwing that word out there. We, I've, I've actually witnessed conversations uh, it, where uh, there was one individual that came before our committee. Right. And, uh, you know, he was founded. I'm not throwing the word out there. I don't use words lightly. I mean, they're communists. Right. Well, they're, 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 they advocate for it. <laughs> I, I watched the, the, the interview, and right. when I saw what was printed, I thought, what is going on here? Uh, who do you trust? Uh, is there an alternative? You know, I mean, and it's not against the law to be a communist, so let's, let's make that clear. If you want to argue for communism, then quit the media and go out there and, and, and advocate openly about it. They can't because it's a failed system. Every system, that every government that's ever tried communism has failed. And soft communism is socialism. So, soft communism is socialism. And every government that's tried socialism is failing because you eventually run out of other people's money. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you and uh, maybe hire you to, uh, to lobby uh, or to, to, to advocate for their position, provided it is a liberty. And I, I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, you will advocate for liberty. Uh, Do nothing else. How do they get in touch with you? Uh, my email address is uh, andrew at Um That's my state rep email address. I also have a business email address, which is uh, andrewmanous at manusmedia.com. And uh, my phone number is 505-4793. I want to thank you for coming on the show, and uh, God bless you for all that you've done for the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm glad that you're staying here, and uh, maybe in a couple of years you, you'll, you'll take the, uh, the, the swing at the bat one more time. It'd we'll be see, nice. We'll see what happens. I'm not leaving politics, that's for sure. Right. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for Speak Up, and uh, please contact uh, Representative Andrew Manus if, uh, if you have a media need, if you need to, so, to somebody to write for you uh, or discuss some, uh, some topics that he's, he's right on top with. So I can't endorse him high enough. Uh, he's been a great resource for us here at the Capitol, and uh, for you out there at large, uh, please contact him if you, if you uh, have some needs. And do me one favor and vote for this guy for state representative. We need more people like him in, in, in the legislature. There, you've heard it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back.